Mikoyan Guryevich, the preeminent fighter aircraft manufacturer for the Soviet Union from the late 1940s all the way until the 1990s. And during the Cold War, no other aircraft designer personified the Soviet Union more than them. From Korea to Vietnam to the Middle East and beyond, their name, or rather their nickname, became well known around the world. Though some knew their full name, most people still knew their nickname. Even Hollywood knew and helped to expand the myth that was the MiG. Hey, I know that the video just started, but be sure to click the subscribe button along with that like button before you forget it. Also, click the notification bell to be notified of our newest video releases. Want to get them earlier? Then consider becoming a member of our Patreon. Also, check out our website at www.combatineffective.com. It has links to our latest videos, Twitter posts, and a link to our Patreon. In Korea, the MiG-15 first showed up on the world stage. It had speed, agility, and firepower to best the Allied jet aircraft like the F-80 Shooting Star, and to decimate the formations of B-29 bombers raining down high explosives on the North Koreans and their Chinese allies. While this strength did not last long after the F-86 Sabre began to fly missions in Korea, the reputation stuck. Terms like MiG Alley became part of the Air Force lexicon. In Vietnam, the MiG-17, itself a variant of the MiG-15, showed that it was still useful against the more modern aircraft flying in the skies over North Vietnam. Many a B-52 crew, along with countless ground attack aircraft, and even F-8 Crusader and F-4 Phantom pilots, learned to be wary of these older jet aircraft. When the Soviets added the MiG-21 to the North Vietnamese arsenal, things only got tougher. The MiG-21 was a good aircraft. Like the MiG-15 before it, it was more than capable against many of the Western fighters around when introduced. To bomber crews, the interceptor was a feared opponent. Designed to dash in at high speeds, hit the bombers, and keep on going before the bombers knew what was happening, and long before their escorts could engage. With the advent of the F-4 Phantom, the Soviet Union began to look for aircraft that would be able to compete with the new fighter. It needed to be fast, have better radar and sensors, and be able to use air-to-air -air missiles that could be used beyond visual range, something that was lacking in the MiG-21. What would follow would be a fighter aircraft that not only failed to be the replacement it was designed to be, but would then be turned into a new version of the aircraft designed specifically for ground attack. Today we are going to look at the MiG-23 Flogger. In 1967, work began on a new fighter design to replace the MiG-15, MiG-17, and MiG-19, along with the MiG-21. The MiG-15 was old and obsolete, and the 17 and 19s were just slightly improved variants of the MiG-15. The MiG-21 was a different aircraft entirely, but the drawbacks with the radar and no beyond visual range missiles, along with limited capacity for more missiles, needed to be addressed in the new aircraft. The new aircraft needed to be fast, but also have better maneuverability at lower speeds and altitudes, another drawback to the MiG-21. This was also a drawback for the MiG-15 as well, which had better high altitude performance than the F-86, but worse performance below 20,000 feet. To do this, the designers decided on a variable geometry wing design. This will enable them to, in theory, give them the best of both a straight wing in low speeds and a swept back configuration for high speed flight. This was not the first aircraft in the Soviet Union or the world to use such a system. The Su-22 Fitter, for instance, had limited variable geometry wings. The American F-111 and F-14 also had variable geometry wing designs. The MiG-23 was also designed right away to deal with the lack of range of the MiG-21 and the lack of hard points for weapon stations. The MiG-23 was given six hard points to the MiG-21's five, and in the usable hard points on the MiG-21, only four as the ventral hard point under the fuselage was used primarily for extended fuel tanks to increase its already limited range. The MiG-23 could also carry a larger variety of missiles, including the R-23, R-77, and R-27 medium and long-range missiles. The MiG-21 was only compatible with the K-13, the R-55, and the R-60, none of which were designed for more than short-range intercepts. The MiG-23 was also designed to be able to carry 500 kilogram bombs under each hardpoint, 
up to a maximum weight of 6,600 pounds. The MiG-21 could only carry two of these 500 kilogram bombs and two 250 kilogram bombs. The MiG-23 was also much faster than the MiG-21, with a top speed of Mach 2.35 or 1,553 miles per hour, compared to the 1,351 miles per hour of the MiG-21. And yet the MiG-23 also had a much greater range. Without drop tanks and a standard weapons loadout, the combat range of the MiG-23 was 930 miles. The MiG-21 with drop tanks could only reach 493 miles. So it was faster, could fly higher, could carry a bigger payload, it had better sensors to be able to attack at longer ranges than any Soviet fighter previously. So then why do we see more of the MiG-21 still flying and less of the MiG-23? The answer, it was too little, too late. The MiG-23 was designed after the MiG-25 Foxbat, an interceptor with such high speed that it scared the West into designing what would become some of the best fighter aircraft ever made. They also had new aircraft about to be introduced that were more advanced from the start. By the time the MiG-23 was introduced in 1970, the F-14 was in production, the F-15 was in testing, and a few years later the F-16 were being built. The MiG-23 was also not enough of an improvement to replace the MiG-21 in the fighter squadrons of the Soviet Union. It was harder to produce the, the MiG-23 in the same numbers. The sensors, the sw wing sweep, all the new technology involved made the price per plane skyrocket from $2 million per plane for the MiG-21 to an estimated $6.6 million for the MiG-23. In combat, the MiG-23 also proved to be somewhat of a disappointment. Early on, when Syrian MiG-23 shot down Israeli F-4 Phantoms, there was a rush to buy more of them. However, the, the excitement of the new aircraft was premature. In the years to follow, the losses would quickly mount. In the Iran-Iraq War, no less than 15 were shot down by F-14 Tomcats and another 16 by F-4 Phantoms. During Desert Storm, a further 43 MiG-23s were destroyed, with at least 8 of them being downed by Coalition F-15s. In the hands of the Libyan Air Force, at least 2 were shot down by Egyptian MiG-21 armed with Western Sidewinder missiles, and a further 2 were shot down by the U.S. Navy F-14s during the Gulf of Citra incident. With the rising losses and the clear supremacy of the new, newest generation of Western fighters, the Soviet Union decided to pursue another aircraft to catch up to the West. In a further showing of the fall from grace, a new variant of the MiG-23, the MiG-27, was produced. The fighter was now relegated to the ground attack role, and in its place, a new fighter would come along to try and regain the legacy that the MiG once had, the MiG-29 Fulcrum. Did the MiG-29 succeed where the MiG-23 failed? That is a tale for another video. We thank you for watching this video. If you like our content and wish to support our channel, then consider becoming a Patreon member. We wish to thank all of our Patreon members for their continued support of this channel. Special thanks to General Ritchie and General Sergio Suarez. Thanks to all of our Sergeant and Captain level patrons listed in the credits below. Coming up in our next video.